let's say you're at your house it's 8 45 p.m. in the evening you've had a very stressful day you've been watching the news as the head of the family you're not sure what's coming you're worried about it am I ready your family stressed you're stressed but you're at the house in the evening suddenly without warning there's a loud knock at your door you grab your Glock tuck it into your waistband look out the window recognize a familiar face two of them actually you open the door and what do they tell you they say it's go time it is go time right now there's a firefight that needs your help grab your gear you have 10 minutes we're hitting it are you ready are you ready no I'm not talking about without rule of law I'm talking about a nut and fancy call out for soldier boy that's what we're talking about that's what this series of videos updated for 2020 on what it is to be tactically squared away yes it is tough to answer the call we do it during bad weather we have done it at that time 8 45 at night there are videos showing us knocking at the doors of tmpers who answered the call go watch them it's hilarious and soldier boy my no notice run and gun drill has a purpose entertainment for sure it's fun to watch uh, it's informative but it is to teach that individual and you the audience that's watching the experience the sb experience about your holes in your preparation if if you're interested you know if you care about such things if you care about being tactically squared away and be able to project force you your from your down. chosen weapon in a certain manner in tough conditions on short notice that's what the soldier boy experience is all about it's fun so i i bet a lot of you guys when i'm giving that entry you're like oh my gosh i think it's going to kick off any day now because when I'm filming this, the COVID-19 scare is getting momentum a lot. We don't know what's coming. Well, watch my sit rep videos. Uh, I did say plural because I do plan on doing more. They are on the Nut and Fancy Project channel. That's the name. So if you go into YouTube and just no spaces, just type out the Nut and Fancy Project Go to that channel, subscribe to that channel. I'm, I'm going to be using it a lot more for the exact purpose I said when I created it a decade ago. That it is a parachute for when YouTube starts harassing me on the A channel for content. I'm going over to the B channel and we'll see what happens. But you need to subscribe to both feeds. I'm going to continue to use A channel. It'll be like gun reviews, uh, other things too. But the B channel is really going to start awakening. It's going to serve its purpose. That's why I created it. I have that sit rep video over there talking about the COVID-19 scare and more importantly, I shouldn't say more importantly, but just as serious, if not more so, are the economic ramifications, the desperation that will emerge from it, the without rule of law that could emerge from it. I do predict some. Okay, so go watch that video. It's serious. I, I, I have some levity. I always do. But I'm doing my best to give you my opinion and just kind of do some broad stroke predictions on how I think it will play out. So that is the foundation, the backdrop, other than a freaking cool RPG, y'all. <laughs> and some other cool stuff in the background, some of which I may reference as we move along here in the bunker. That's a backdrop of when I'm filming this. So I know this video will get a lot of attention. I'm probably going to post it on the B channel to just teach everybody, hey, you need to, as I've been saying for 10 years, subscribe to that channel because here we go. It's This is where the feed is. Now, that being said, the only reason I'm really working as hard as I do in TMP it, are because of the donors. So if you're a donor to the Nut and Fancy Project, thank you. They are the reason this exists. They are the reason that I continue. I am demonetized and have been for a long time. I may have a video or two uh, cranking down like 7.3 cents of revenue um, that's on the B channel only uh, but it's very rare so the donors are sponsoring this video if you want to be one it's never too late stick with me through thick and thin that's what I ask uh, I don't even have tiers there just even a buck a month 
uh, opens up all the content. There's a buttload of content out there that you, you will never see on the ARB channel. And it's just that way. So I de deliver a lot of value to those guys. I have been doing it for years. It's worked out really good. Currently, I'm using Patreon. Will I go to another thing? I don't know. But do that, and it motivates me to work hard for you like this, to answer questions on being tactically squared away. It's really cool that I waited to do part two because I did part one, tactically squared away, and I really like how it turned out. Um, and then I saw your questions, your comments on it. There, there was a lot of enthusiasm about it. I do focus a lot of my attention in my Patreon side because those guys, I know them personally because it's a smaller community. I can wrap my head around it more easily. And uh, they do represent you guys, all team peers, so they're a cross section. And so I hope to address some of those questions here. In part one, I'm going to assume you watched that, by the way. Uh, I'll put a link of it, link to it either below or <clears throat> somewhere. And if I forget, just search it out. <coughs> Excuse me. No, it's not COVID as far as I know. But uh, go watch part one. What I talk about there is the foundation of being tactically squared away. Okay, and that is physical fitness, being prepared. You know, if you're pushing 280 pounds, you can't really walk that far. You have some medical conditions. Um, you know, are, are you able to, to do the stuff I'm going to talk about? Are you able to go do a soldier boy call out? The answer is honestly, no, you're not. I, I wish I could answer differently, but you're not. We've had people come out in TMP, not necessarily the soldier boy do run and gun. And we basically had to shut it down because they're so out of shape. They're fat, they're breathing hard. I'm worried for their safety, and so we just say, mm -mm. Uh, we'll do a, a walk and gun. We're going to condense the course. We'll, we'll still shoot, but we can't do the running. Also in part one, I talked about my approach to all of this. I'm not the end-all expert in all things tactical. That's not what this video is about. I'm not going to get in front of the camera and say, this is the way you need to do it. I don't care how you do it. But guys come to me and they go, how do you do it? That's what this video is about. How will I do it in without rule of law during a neighborhood patrol? That's what this video is about. It's just my approach. I thought it out. I've used it a lot out in the desert. I've trimmed my systems. Uh, I adhere to the KISS principle. I'm going to hammer that. It's, it's just what works for me. Also, I do not subscribe and actually detest tactical elitism. And there is a shitload in YouTube about guys who just act like they're all that and they posture, they puff their chest out. There's a ton of ego there and uh, they just act like, you know, this is the only way you can do it. Here's my background, blah, blah, blah. I don't even watch those videos. They make me want to vomit. I quit watching those about 10 years ago. That's not this. Okay. I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to be honest. We will talk about a martial system. Uh, I will assume, like I said in part one, that you are a civilian sheepdog for the most part, maybe a law enforcement, a four constitution law enforcement officer. Just the good people everywhere. If I look at my statistics, which I do approximately every seven years here in YouTube, that's no exaggeration, by the way, about every seven years, <laughs> I'll dig into them. YouTube has all types of metrics and I'll see where my people live that watch the channel. Most of them, of course, live in the United States, but there are others. Some great TMPers down in Australia, for example. Those guys are awesome. They're just like you, by the way, and they are pro-Constitution, pro-U.S. Constitution. They don't like their government, their laws any more than you like them. They're TMPers just like you. This video is for them too, albeit they live in a different society, under different laws. They don't have access to all this stuff that we have. But they have this, the same thing you have, a strong moral value system. They know good and they know evil. Okay, and I've made a video about this about 10 years ago. It's called Fear No Evil. And a lot more just like it, talking about that, about how good people have to stand up against evil, even in situations that are dire even in situations where there is no rule of law. And we might be experiencing that quite soon in this country. That's right. We might be experiencing without rule of law. But this video is for you guys. 
there you go. Now, hopefully you watched part one. Okay, in part one, again, I super, super stress the importance of being physically fit, not being an operator. You don't have to haul a hundred pound load for 25 miles. That's not what I said. I said, can you walk 10 miles with a 30 pound load? Running helps too. I won't go over it all again. I do want to super stress this because what we're going to get into now assumes that you are first and foremost, basically physically fit. Two, you are basically competent with your system. You know how to hit with your gun of choice. Okay. You know how to use the gear you have chosen. You have gone out and tested it. You have gone out and streamlined your shit. Okay. I'm going to assume that you've done that. I'll impart a few lessons to you here in the bunker, but you need to do that on your own and square your stuff away. I'll try not to cuss as much. It sure is fun though. Okay. So please go watch part one. Here we go. Part two. And I'm going to start off with, with what I will call a rata. In other words, we're going to kind of jump around a little bit. And these, again, are based on questions that I had from mostly TMP Patreon members that they asked. And one of them is, um, how do I prepare for the Soldier Boy call out? And how do I prepare for that rule of law? Are they the same system? Are they different systems? Can I just make one rig and just go with that? <clears throat> Here's my answer. I would really be honest with yourself and figure out what is your mission, okay? And I said that in part one, you really t need to know what your mission is in the military when you load up your F-16, your F-35, your KC-135. Am I going on a cargo mission? Am I going on a refueling mission? Am I, am I ground strike? Am I BFM, basic fighter maneuvers? It's gonna determine your loadout. The same thing applies for soldier boy. And again, by association, we're talking about rule of law. The, the broad answer is if you do it right, you can use them for both. Okay, and you will have some compromises. Okay, my system is not perfect. It never is. Neither will your system be perfect. You're going to have to adhere to the very, very important principle of SAWC. If you ignore that principle, you're a dummy. I've preached about it forever. I've preached about the, the push and pull between firepower and mobility. When we talk about our rigs, how much ammo we're carrying, the kind of weapon we're carrying, do we integrate body armor? Do we have comms? Do we have optics? SAWC, bro. And that's, that's where we get to a lot of blowhards in YouTube. They'll set out their rigs and they have all this shit on it. Fishing kits, bungee cords for helicopters, all kinds of stuff on there. I'm like, dude, come on now. That's not realistic. That's thrown together for YouTube. Okay, don't do that. Pair it down and get mission focused. So back to the question, what do you intend to do with this? If you're just pre prepping for a soldier boy call out, then here's what you need to prep for. 25 to 400 yards, 25 will be your pistol, 400 yards will be your tactical carbine of choice. You'll be engaging at night in cold weather. It could be raining. It could be snowing. There's going to be high winds. You're going to be running a lot. There's no time for re reloads. If a site goes down, you're going to have to transition to something else. If your main weapon goes down, you got to transition to something else. You are going to be under stress. You're going to be timed. We're not your friend in round one. And we're not. I mean, I've lightened up a lot in Soldier Boy from the first times I did. I mean, I used to be yelling at the guys, just being kind of a dick. Not for just uh, being a dick sake. <laughs> but to amp stress levels. And I kind of backed off on that because in post-production, I was listening to it. I was like, well, that's kind of obnoxious to, to hear yelling at the guy the whole time. That's why we don't do it. But in principle, I wish we could because we really want you stressed. And again, those are the ranges. No time for reloads. You're going to have probably, these days we're doing like three runs and it depends on, uh, on the course of fire that we set up, Jardine and I set up, but generally you're going to be popping 60 to 80 rounds per run and that's not including pistol sometimes we'll just have you go through three mags a pistol then you transition a rifle uh three mags there that's six uh i guess 90 rounds maybe not quite just depends but there you go prep for that now that being said we took uh one dude up on a ridge in in, in the snow and soldier boy 
and all he had was an unmagnified optic and we had a mini ipsic plate i believe i don't think it was full size ipsic at 400 yards and he's trying to hit it with this basically aim point and not doing well it's not his fault he, he was a really solid shooter he was but his Joey. side of choice was set up for cqb he set up for basically a 100 yard shot now you can have a, a long discussion here if you want i don't care i'm not going to answer it and i've already addressed it in multiple videos magnified versus unmagnified optic you know right now i'm to like a one to five to a one uh one to five one to six to one to eight that's kind of where i'm at right now but he was struggling that's a soldier boy requirement is that a a valid without rule of law requirement are you really going to be shooting at 400 yards probably not 300 nope 200 mm, probably not 100 becomes more likely 50 more likely 25 oh now you're getting warm now you're getting warm my point in bringing this up is that guy's rig for without rule of law was actually a good setup you follow but for soldier boy not so much because the requirements for soldier boy are so stringent okay and they're built that way for a reason because i want to have a system that can flex to all those different applications mission focus so when we talk about the actual loadout let's let's also go into this we're talking philosophy here guys eat it up when i talk this so i'm going to give i'm going to lay it on heavy here what are you trying to do let's step away from soldier boy for a little bit and we'll go to without rule of law what are you trying to do are you just trying to stop a zombie apocalypse that you're going to have lots and lots of people just storming you i've seen some other videos in youtube where the guy's carrying like eight nine magazines completely violating realistic applications of SAWC unless he's in a static defensive location. But if he's in run and gun, if, if you showed up to Soldier Boy, I'm going to bounce back to SB real quick. If you showed up to Soldier Boy and I saw you um, carrying like nine mags and plus you got all your other shit on there, you got a knife, you got IFAC, you've got body armor, I'm going to run you. You're going to be running. I'm going to run you hard. If I can, if we have time that night, I'm going to run you like before you even take one shot, you're going to do a hundred yard dash because I want to drive home the point of SAWC. Oh, and by the way, Jardine and I have done that. And the guy's huffing and puffing and he can't stay on target and his sights are bouncing everywhere. He can't hit nothing. You've seen it on camera. And uh, I'm driving home the importance of what I've talked about in the reviews is you're not a Superman. You cannot take unlimited amount of weight. <sighs> pare it down back to mission focus what are you trying to do when we talk about soldier boy i already talked about rounds counts to you there so basically if you show up with four mags on your vest three pistol mags you'll be good for at least one run probably two runs depending again how we run the drill i also think four without a rule of law jumping ahead a little bit you'll be just fine in fact probably more than just fine okay what are you trying to do where i go when i think about without rule of law is what i mentioned in uh, rules of without rule of law go watch that video it was posted in july of 2019 it's called without rule of law rules and then without rule of law rules of engagement those are foundational to what i'm talking about here please look those videos up <coughs> not covid and i talked about micro communities mcs so basically we lose without rule of law i'm, I'm sorry we lose rule of law no police no fire no medical you're on your own now you can go solo and be the lone wolf and you'll get owned or you can build a team within your neighborhood and establish a micro community of like-minded people and by the way at that time most normal people will be like-minded and that is to preserve law and order in your micro community you establish the boundaries of what that is so that micro community will have a council right i call it uh they'll have a cps community protection standards they'll develop those you have an mc council again I, i'm jumping into those videos a lot of philosophy given there i say all that to talk about the focus of the mission so if you are tapped to be a patrolling member to establish the boundaries of your micro community to establish law and order and maintain law and order in that micro community that should be your focus 
That should be your focus. Not repelling a zombie horde, but taking your turn on foot patrol for eight to 10 hours. Now, let me say this, and uh, I was joking about the zombie horde thing, of course, but sometimes in life, and you guys are gonna like this, it's gonna be kind of a wake up call to everybody watching this video. Sometimes in life, we apply past paradigms. So we think that the way it happened before is the way it's gonna happen in the future. We did that 9-11. So the bad guys come up in the cockpit and we go, oh, hijack situation, cool. Let's negotiate, we'll give them what they want, we land, nobody's hurt. Didn't turn out that way. They weren't out to land, they weren't out even to live, they wanted to take everybody out and as many people on the ground as possible. That's because we were functioning under the old paradigm of hijacking, which is long gone. Now everybody knows what the new rules are. It's like, oh, taking over the plane, they're gonna fly it into the building, they're gonna kill a lot of people. The new paradigm that I want you guys to wrap your mind about when we talk about without rule of law and your micro community and protecting your micro community is this. I don't think it's gonna be two guys coming in the middle of the night wearing ski masks with a pump shotgun and a Mosin-Nagant. I think it's gonna be an organized, orchestrated group of people that will roll into your neighborhood and gonna have their way. And they will be heavily armed, probably as good, if not better, than you. That's what I think is gonna happen. They're gonna be organized and they're just gonna roll in and say, listen, we're gonna take your resources, and if you don't comply, this is what's gonna happen. I could be totally wrong and I probably don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. Just keep that in mind. But it could happen. So that is what you should prepare for, right? But again, I'm assuming there is a micro community, there is a council, there are more people than just you to run this patrol. There's more people than you to be prepared for without real law and to be geared up. I say that because this means you can work share and you're not going lone wolf. Now I have said in multiple videos, you might have to go lone wolf. I don't really know. Maybe you live in a bad neighborhood. Maybe you live in a, a, a really remote area and it's just you and your family and you gotta do what you gotta do. I will tell you this, that means you're gonna have to carry more ammo. You gotta be completely independent and good luck because you don't have anyone watching your back. But in a group situation, a micro community, let's say it is this worst case where it's a group of highly organized bad guys rolling in to do whatever they're gonna do in your neighborhood, take your food, um, do bad things, basically exert their will on you and project force in your, in your micro community, you're gonna resist because that's evil. evil. Evil's coming to your neighborhood then now there's gonna be a, a group of good guys, that's you, standing up with their preparedness, their mental preparation, and resisting. The, the rigs I'm gonna talk about are for that. The loadouts I'm gonna talk about are for that. It's not, you know, uh, jumping out of a helicopter and A-stand, doing door-to-door -door in Fallujah. That's a completely different mission. You have support, you have uh, medical people waiting for you, you have ammunition resupply, you have magazine replacement, you have batteries for your uh, battery operated things, you can recharge your headsets. You may not have any of this in Without Rule of Law in your community. There you go. That, that's what we're talking about. So I hope that answered the question. Um, if you're prepared for Soldier Boy, if you do it properly, yes, you could be prepared for that rule of law, but not necessarily. You cannot prepare for everything. Um, and remember what I said about the weather thing, bad weather, that means you're gonna be wearing, out, you know, outer gear has to be selected properly, good foot gear, good socks. If, like me, I have a bad right knee, that means I gotta be braced up. We all have issues, you gotta address that. Okay, be mission focused and make a realistic system. And by the way, my approach could be completely different from what you need in your situation. Um, it could be completely different. I did mention the KISS principle. I'm a big believer in that. Uh, I see guys wearing LBE and they're stacking it out like, you know, tons of magazines once again. And they, again, we've had guys come out like that and they have like three magazines deep on their, on their rig and then I have them go prone. And it's really uncomfortable to go prone with that. 
never mind not getting shot at. So if you're getting shot back and you're trying to bury into the ground as low as possible and you've got, you got a radio right here and it looks really cool, but now you can't get low to the ground, you could get capped. Again, pre-flight your gear, streamline it, always adhere to the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. If it's not needed, get rid of it. If it's not giving you a direct increased capability, dump it. Talk to guys who have humped gear over there in Afghanistan, for instance. They'll say that. I was like, man, if it's, you know, if it's not, not serving a direct purpose, I mean, I'm, I'm doing like 50 mile hike today and I'm dumping it. You'll learn. You'll learn by experience. And again, experience is the best teacher. Again, getting back to soldier boy. Uh, you don't have to be an operator. Uh, sometimes guys, again, this is a question I got on Patreon. Uh, they watch videos and maybe the guy is an operator, maybe it isn't, but he has an operator's approach. That isn't what my system is. I'm not trying to be like an operator. All I'm doing is trying to, um, uh, I see a problem. There's certain gear I need to have. How do I integrate it in the most streamlined KISS principle way possible? And that's what I've developed in TMP. Again, it's just my approach, but I don't give a shit if I look like an operator or not. I, I wear multicam because in a lot of uh, places in my, uh, where I, I shoot, and I've always called it my operational environment, multi-cam works really good. And maybe I just want to hide and not fire a shot. Maybe the guys are just passing through my area of responsibility and I don't want to engage. Again, the run away principle is huge. If you can run away and you're not getting directly threatened, don't engage. Duh. Again, we see s some different thoughts on that in boob tube here and it's stupid. I've always advocated standing down, negotiating, uh, no violence if at all possible. No one gets hurt. But uh, if worse comes to worse, uh, if evil's going to do evil things, you either stand there and let it happen or you stand up and uh, don't let it happen. Another question I had, again, we're going over at it. I promise I'm going to get into specifics. I won't cover everything. There's no way I have time or actually even room in the damn bunker. There's no way I can fit it. I already got a bunch of stuff here. I got weapons all over here, support gear. It's insane. Another question I had is, dude goes, uh, great team here. He goes, hey, um, do I go loud and overt in, in my preparations or do I go concealed? A lot of people call it the gray concept, whatever. It really depends on what you're trying to do. Like in my L pack and H pack videos, that is low probability for armed conflict, high probability for our armed conflict, EDC systems. Those are two videos you should watch. I address this. And both of those systems are actually designed to be low key, concealed. In H pack, I have more fire ca firepower capability. But um, there will come a time, I think, being overt can have its benefits. Let's go back to the community protection standards, your micro community that supposedly you have established and without rule of law. I know there's a lot of acronyms, but this is a language we speak in the TMP world. Now you can see why we have that language because there's a lot of concepts being discussed here. So we go back to that. You have the boundaries. You might want to go overt in that situation because in that situation, Maybe there's people that are scouting for weakness, but they see three guys, one, two, three, loaded up. They got like level three loadouts, ARs, AKs, they're patrolling, they're very vigilant, they have backup, have a backup sharpshooter from a high location. They see that guy too. Maybe they don't if he's doing his job right. And they go, you know what? This target's not as soft as we thought. Let's move on. Okay, so a show of force can be advantageous. During the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles, this is ancient history for you young people, but there were shop owners that went on top of their shops with shotguns, uh, with I think some ARs too, mini 14s, whatever, and they just stood out and they're basically saying, hey, if you come and burn my shop down, you're gonna get capped. Those shops weren't touched. So the show of force served a purpose. Is that the old paradigm? could be are you painting a target on you where someone at long range could take you out because they go oh look at that that's their neighborhood patrol let's shoot from a long distance and we'll take them out you do run that risk you'll have to determine in your situation with all the variables that you'll be faced with if that's the best way to go maybe it would be wiser to go clandestine 
So I would load up with, time to show you some gear, something like this, along with my maybe uh, AR-15 pistol underneath a Gore-Tex raincoat that is very loose and at a distance you don't really know. And maybe they look at you and they go, oh, that's a normal dude just taking a walk. There's ways to hide it. In fact, most of my LBE systems are very streamlined. They don't stick out very long, uh, much at all. In fact, this shell that I, this soft shell I have right here, they, I could hide one. You know, I can't carry like 400 rounds on it, but I can carry three mags and maybe three or four pistol mags. You, most people wouldn't even notice. Long gun, harder to conceal. So that's my answer to that. It's very situationally dependent on what's going on um, and just use your judgment. And by the way, when I say you, I, I literally mean you, whoever's watching this video, because like I've stressed over the years, you're going to be in charge of your neighborhood, probably. Because if you're watching this video, you've put a lot of thought behind it. You probably have your own systems. You're a smart guy. Um, you have that value system, which I totally love. You're a good person. You're going to be the leader. You're going to be setting this all up in your micro community and uh, or just coming out to the desert and <laughs> run with us. Uh, so I hope I, I I answer that. It's not necessary that you run around with a bunch of Gucci tactical crap on you and drawing attention to yourself right off the bat. Um, in most situations, probably that's not the best idea. You want to go clandestine, but there is a time and place to go loud with your preparations. But I would, like I said, I mentioned a sharpshooter having your back. I always like that. So I'd always have a long range guy, his job, he'll run eight hour shifts. He's watching everybody who's patrolling. And if he's basically giving support fire, if anything happens and, and he's doing his job, like I said, they don't even know he's there and he can, he's giving support fire with, well, like this, a 308 sapper. Getting back to my tabletops. I've talked about that. Moving on. I will talk about the specifics of mission support gear, LBE, ammo loadout, and some other things here in just a second. I promise, hang with me. But I do want to stress before we move into that arena, your mental preparation. I did mention it in part one, but I really want to underscore it again here in part two. Are you ready to do this? Let's go back to Soldier Boy. I call guys out. Jardine and I take them out in the desert. Sometimes it's 25 degrees, it's snowing, it's cold. It's a lot to deal with, but get this, you're not even getting shot at. It's a one-way shooting range. And you would think that would be easy, right? It ain't easy. Ask the guys who have done it. You're running a lot. You are under some stress. We make sure of that at least for the first, maybe the second run, and then we lighten up and, do, and we do instructional stuff. But the first run, definitely, you're winded, and guess what? There's something going wrong with your system. Your optic isn't working, your zero's wrong, you've had a jam, you drop Hold some on. gear, on, it's snowing, you don't know where it is, fog of war sets in. Look at our debrief sessions for Soldier Boy, if you don't believe me. That really is the best part of Soldier Boy. When you listen to those really cool team peers who have come out, they've experienced it, and they're telling you what they've learned, they're basically saying the same thing. It's pretty tough. And one of the lessons we talk about in Soldier Boy is that it is a primarily mental toughness you need. So that's Soldier Boy, that's in Rule of Law, that should be pretty easy, it's not, it's challenging. I'm not saying it's like hiking up Everest or nothing, I'm not saying it's like kicking doors in in Fallujah, I'm just saying it beats uh, shooting at a range. Shooting at a range on a concrete bench, a lot easier. Going out, going out in the desert, snow, or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, after running, shooting 400 yards is a little bit tougher, that's all I'm saying. But let's transition again into without rule of law. Have you thought it through? Do you have the mental toughness? Because get, get this, you may have services ceased. No electricity, no water, no sewage, no natural gas. You may have none of that. So you're eating out of food storage. You may have some health issues cropping up. You may not feel good. You may not be sleeping well. And then you have all these other things, uh, environmentals. You have bad guys coming in. 
you're going to have to make these life and death de decisions with the backing of your micro council, like I said, community protection standards, hopefully. Oh, and then maybe throw in an earthquake or two. We just had a 5.9 in Utah. 5.9. So we have the COVID-19 shit going on, and now we've got earthquakes. What if that happens again? What if we get a 7.8 here and everything's just wrecked? Now you got COVID, you've got a pandemic, and then you have people, the wolves of society, that move in to take advantage of that situation. It will happen. Are you mentally prepared for that? I, I'm just being honest with you guys. Am I? I'm not acting like I'm some guru here. I'm just saying, hey, you got to think it through, and there's going to be some ugly decisions that will have to be made. There really won't be um, a clear-cut choice. You're just going to have to say, hey, this is the best we can do in this situation. How do we approach it? And how do we protect protect life to reestablish rule of law in our MC? Think it through, please. It's a lot. And being a modern people who have been pampered over the last decades, and I said that in my sit rep, when have we had to deal with this? Unless you've been in the military fighting a war, those guys have had to deal with it. They've seen it up, up close. They've seen death and destruction and all these other awful things that a pampered modern people have not experienced. Widespread death and disease, destruction. Again, this is worth, worst case, but this might be the very backdrop in which you're doing your neighborhood patrol. It ain't no video game, bro. It ain't no video game. And a lot of people think it is. They think it is. And that's why you see these ridiculous loadouts from people. They go, oh, it's like a video game. Yeah, I'll, I'll just like, look like a Navy SEAL operator. No, no, no. All right, enough of that. Here we go. Moving into the specifics of uh, being tactically squared away, part two. And this is what you guys have been waiting for. Remember in part one, I did talk about weapon selection. I have a couple examples on the back wall. You have one of my AR-15 builds here. This is post-shoulder surgery. Let's see how I do. Oh, it's okay. Not great, but I'm getting there. So this is one of my sappers, 18-inch, 5.56. RPG, now I'll leave that at home. And then uh, SIG 550. <laughs> Guys are just loving this SIG 550. I don't know why. Uh, I don't like it. It's inaccurate. SIG 550s are a joke. They're too heavy and they're inaccurate. You can have them. They sure look cool, though. It's a video game choice. Oh, there you go. There's a good one. Sapper. So an AR-10, this is a 716 Gen 2. It is fantastic. Watch my review. Great choice. Uh, how about an AK variant? This one's set up for close range. Speaking of close range. And this is an actual system that I take out in the desert. And guess what? It's always hot because it defends all the guns I have on loan from Gunnies or Handgun Haven. And there's a lot of money there. And so this is my close range AK system, my build. An SGL 21, once upon a year, Cerakoted. This is a great option. Just choose the one you like. Understand what the SAD, SAWC penalties will be for each. And that's really important as we go into ammo loadout. How much ammo do I take with me? Again, we're mission focused. And for my mission focus, I'm doing a neighborhood patrol in without rule of law or I'm doing Soldier Boy. Soldier Boy, I say four mags is good enough. And guess what? For that rule of law, I say four mags is great as well. 120 rounds. If you want to carry more, you can carry more, but you better have a good reason why. A good reason why would be, getting back to what I mentioned previously, is that you're solo. You don't have any backup. You do not have any team members. You are it. If that's the situation, just know what your weights are going to be and deal with it. If you go with a fully loaded... AR mag, it's one pound. If you go with a fully loaded, lightweight AK mag, it's a pound and a half. So four pounds for four of these, six pounds for four of these. Okay, are you going to rule the world in a without rule of law situation with that much ammunition? No, you're not trying to. All you're trying to do literally is get the bad guys to get out of there. Aren't you? You're just trying to get the bad guys go somewhere else. I mean, if we get down to brass tacks, we're just trying to do that. I am assuming also with that four magazines that you do have other team members, that they too have a loadout, that there is some work sharing, some ammunition sharing going on. You should have cal caliber commonality. It wouldn't make a lot of sense for your team member to have, team member to have an AK and you have an AR. 
should have complete ammo commonality, magazine commonality would in that patrol. Ideally, ideally, maybe it doesn't happen because a lot of your neighbors don't have crap. <laughs> it, it could be that way. But I would say 120 rounds. Uh, I have talked about this in years past. I forget what I said in Tactically Squared Away when I initially did it, but I was laser beam focused on a, a run and gun with a nothing fancy project for that. I'm kind of expanding with current events for what we're talking about. Uh, pistol Max, and let me show you this, this rig right here. And this is a tactical assault gear. They turned into shellback tactical. Um, plate carrier. I have used it. You've seen it in a lot of videos over the years. If you haven't, you haven't been paying attention or you're new. But here, do I have four? I just have three on this one right now. Okay, so I have 90 rounds here. And then I do have a pistol integrated in a horizontal carry fashion, of which I am still a proponent of. Is it perfect? No. Uh, quicker is a holster mounted, I'm sorry, a belt mounted system. But in, uh, again, this is kind of the blend between a, a shooting drill and without rule of law. This is more focused toward a shooting drill where it's a grab and go system and I have everything in one stop shopping as I've always said. This is a Walther PPQ and then I have, uh, I think believe four mags. Yeah, in, with the one in the pistol I have four mags total. And that's generally what I will go with in a without rule of law situation. Four pistol mags. I'm only showing you three here. I have another rig down here I'll show you. But four as well. It'd be easy enough for me to add another rifle mag here on the side. Probably on this side right here. I just have a utility pouch here. But what you're seeing in this rig is a KISS principle in action. Right? With this shell back tactical rig. Do you see a lot of extraneous shit on here? No, you don't. Would I add some stuff on here in a neighborhood patrol? Certainly. I'm, I'm going to go over that mission support gear. I'm going to show you what I would add. But again, it would have to serve a direct purpose and it would have to be worth the weight. As in W E I G H T. <laughs> yeah, so this is just an example. Now, this holster, by the way, is the old TAC Force one. They don't make it anymore. And man, they were cool. It's a Molly holster, it works great. It has a disadvantage, and yes, it is two-handed. So it has a fast text buckle there that I have to undo. It's a little bit slow. But that's another myth, I think, right? One of the myths out there is that you have to be super, super fast. What does that name tape say? Oh, yeah, suck less. That's appropriate. Um, that you have to be super, super fast. That's a bunch of crap. You just have to be super, super accurate, says nothing fancy. Again, go back to Soldier Boy. Do we want you to be super fast on the drill? Not really. We want you to be able to run at a good speed, get in position, make the shots. But we're not act asking you to be some freaking operator or some three-gun competitor. We don't. We want you to hit what you're shooting at. So if it takes me a half a second more or one second more for me to deploy my pistol, generally that's not going to make a big difference. Says me. What do I know? I'm just a YouTuber, though. I'm just an idiot. Yeah. Uh, this right here is the old magazine... I'm sorry, the old magnetic uh, tactical assault gear pouches, and I sure like them. They're awesome. A little bit heavier, so they have little magnets in them that hold them. And then I also use the Blue Force gear, like the elastic pouches. I might have some of those to show you. So, ammo loadout. That's kind of what we're talking about. And I am jumping into LBE, obviously. I want to show you what a sapper loadout looks like, and maybe we'll talk about that. I have said on my tabletop reviews, this is a Sapper semi-automatic precision rifle, 76251. I have said multiple times, and I will stick with it, if SAWC permits, I will take a Sapper to answer the call of without rule of law, I will stick with that. Even in a neighborhood patrol, I will stick with it, with, a, with one asterisk, and it's this. I have other team members that have ARs or AKs. Because I'm going to be more ammo limited, I cannot take as many rounds with the 308 Sapper. I'm calling it 308 Sapper as I can the other guns. But what this does for me is it just solves problems. It defeats obstacles. It goes through glass better. No, it's not a 50 cal, but it's a lot better than either an AK or a 556. Even shooting 77s. Yeah, Sapper. Your guy, your sharpshooter, I was talking about, that's providing cover for your uh, neighborhood patrol. This is a gun he should be running. 
an MP10, a really quality AR-10. I've reviewed a lot of awesome 308 battle rifles. 7.16 G2. This is amazing. Accurate, reliable. This is a piston-driven gun. Not super light, but in that application, who cares? He's shooting from concealment, and actually the weight will help him steady the gun. So this is a great soldier boy choice, too, and yet we've never had anybody show up with a sapper. And Jardine and I are always scratching our heads. We don't see AKs come out. We don't see sappers come out. By the way, this is a flashlight mount. I don't have it mounted right now, in case you're wondering. We don't know why either. It's like, I think it's because cost, because the ammo is a lot more expensive. And then uh, end of reasons why. I really don't know. I mean, I think an AR-10 should show up to Soldier Boy and the guy should own it. We're still waiting. Not that we do that many SBs. We do not. But uh, if you're going to run that sapper, here comes another rig set up for it. Get ready for more weight. The ammo weighs more. I've talked about this at length. Your rig's going to weigh more. It is what it is. Okay. Now, this is not a high quality rig. It's the old Condor rig. But guess what? It freaking works. And you don't necessarily need, need something whiz bang. Like some cry rig or something. C-R-Y-E operator approved rig. A lot of these lower cost rigs will work just fine. And I know this from personal experience. Because we've ran them out in the desert for years and they've never failed us. They're just good. Are they perfect? Do they breathe as good as the really high-end stuff? Mm, not usually. But I'll tell you what, they just work. Remember, our, our grandfathers in World War II, what were they packing? That The, the old cotton web gear they had? <laughs> it was like the, like the 1956 LCE. I wrote it down what the name of that stuff was. Um, yeah, 1956 LCE. The load carrying equipment. Uh, so this is like, you know, 20 times better than that. It'll be just fine. I say that. Here comes a mini rant, dude. Hey, nothing. I love your rants. Bring it. Okay, here it is. There is so much under the table crap in YouTube where guys are getting money to promote certain gear. It's just so much shit. Okay, and that comes with slings, load bearing equipment and so when you see your favorite gun tuber out there promoting this and that and he acts like it's the only one this is the only gun this is the only caliber chances are he's been paid off okay he's getting a kickback from it that's why so my point in ranting with this is i really wouldn't worry about getting a 400 dollars lbe setup get something that's good there are some crappy ones out there that i have railed on over the years that works for you and your body style you're good. Okay, so this one, I'm not getting rid of it. I paid, what, 80 bucks for this? And now here it is set up for sapper. Told you I was gonna talk about sapper, didn't forget. But look at my weight for, for this is a Glock 17 and a horizontal carry. And I've, I do have four mags with it total. And then I have four sapper mags. And I believe they're 20 rounders, not 25s. These actually might be 25s right here. They are. Magpul. Oh, I don't even have them loaded though. I was like, oh, it's only 18 and a half pounds. That's why. Let's see if this one's loaded. Okay, so once I load these, these are going to be a lot heavier. But as it sits now, this rig is 18 and a half pounds with armor plates in it. I will talk about that separately. I can't cover everything. There's your weight, by the way, for 20 rounds of 308. Told you you're going to have fewer rounds but it, you do get more firepower as far as you know power of the round i mean not in rounds count so once i load these 25s up and i throw some other stuff on there i would guesstimate with my other gear this rig with body armor and i'm talking lightweight plates in it i'll show you the plates i have in it here in a second mm, at least 25 pounds and that's not counting water and probably some other stuff I'll have. Now, if you're carrying a bunch of other stuff, be careful again about making uh, you know a, a, your system too bulky. I would just recommend putting a backpack on it. And that way you can take the backpack off and access your, your food, your MREs, your goodies you have. Maybe you carry your first aid stuff in there. I think a backpack is essential. On the back of this one, I do have an integrated pouch woven into the molly but the disadvantage with this particular system is for me to access it i have to have someone else do it for me or i have to take it off 
And when I take it off, I don't have my pistol readily accessible and I'm also losing my armor protection. You know, in a down situation where it's some time off break, it's not a big deal. Uh, now this one has side cummerbunds for some side soft plates. I generally won't wear those because they provide so little protection. They're just more complexity. Back when I first started TMP, I was a big advocate of side plates. I do have some soft uh, front level 3A plates that I'll put in there. They are pretty lightweight. Maybe I run those, but again, it's only giving you like an eight inch protective surface down here on your torso. Uh, and by the way, make sure you do position this correctly. If you are running armor, that it is going to be over your vital organs. There's plenty of information online of how to do that. Back to weapon selection. So just know how many rounds you're going to carry, how you're going to integrate them. And if you do choose an AK, which I do still say is an outstanding choice, this one again is set up for CQB, not necessarily Soldier Boy. I say more power to you. I love the 30 cal round. It's an intermediate uh, cartridge. I think of it as a 200 yard round, which is completely adequate for Soldier, I'm sorry, for without rule of law. Soldier Boy on our 400 yard shots, uh, it could be challenging. You need an accurate AK and I would definitely scope it. Um, but if you do have a stamped receiver AK, there are some variances with that rail. We've learned that it's just hard. You can do it, but everything goes wrong out there. You've seen that. Let me show you a couple other things here. When we talk about loadouts. I did mention that you shouldn't really stress about which LBE to use. Probably the one you got is good enough. Um, make sure it fits, make sure it's stable during running, during crawling, make sure it's stable, make sure your stuff doesn't fall off on it. You need to lock it down. That comes with trial and error i.e. experience. One thing that I use just in the testing phase also in drills and I've gone back to it, I started TMP with it and I'm doing it more and more is the cross draw vest. I just absolutely love it. Is it uh, considered Gucci and tactically cool? Probably just the opposite. I haven't checked but I bet you there's a lot of people in YouTube that think that if you're rocking a cross, cross draw you're a dipshit. I bet you that's what they think. They, oh that guy's new. He just came out of the airsoft community. He doesn't know what the hell is going on. Again, we see that tactical elitism being disconnected from what I feel is truth. The truth is, does it hold your gear securely? Yes. Is it easy to put on? Yes. Is it simple? Yes. Does it last? Yes. Is it comfortable? Yes. Does it breathe? Yes. And on the yeses go. So when you talk to guys and they go, oh, that's not a good choice. You know, what they're saying is that I'm trying to impress people with my Gucci gear, I'm not really trying to prep for anything. And that, that, that sentiment has been out in online forever and I absolutely detest it. I think it's just totally full of shit. Yeah, I speak my mind. This is what you guys dial in for. Right? That's why I keep going year after gear. You know there's no horse shit here. Sorry I'm cussing so much, I'll try not to. Now, the disadvantage is the cross draw. And this is the old TAC force, they went out of business, but Blackhawk still Last time I checked, makes a really nice cross draw vest. I do have one of those as well. You've seen it in operation. I do use cross draw vests to give to loner crew members when they don't have anything. Cause again, it just works. It's super easy to adjust to them, to make it comfortable. Has like adjustment straps here. We do have to adjust these according to the weather. If you're wearing jackets or something, you gotta loosen it. Hot weather, you tighten it. Uh, but yeah, Blackhawk is a good rig. This one has been great to have multiple of these. And I think at the time I only paid like 70 bucks per and great nylon, great stitching, they haven't failed. Velcro is kind of getting on the weak side now after years of using it, but guess what, they still work. And then if I want to access the AR, or my, actually this will take AK and AR mag, mag all day long, I'll just tuck the flap inside and it is elasticized still and it still does have some, have, has some elasticity to it. And it has a universal holster, again two-handed, not the quickest draw in the West for sure, but again, it works. Why do I need to fix something that works? To be cool? To spend more money? It works. Okay, and so on this one, I would have 90 rounds without doing something else, but I could easily add a Kydex uh, other mag to my belt area, or I could just do a soft pouch to get that 120 count. And I do have the four magazines for my pistol, which I get, again, I think in our scenario is reasonable. And actually for Soldier Boy, it's reasonable as too. And then look at how breathable it is and how lightweight this is. I mean, it doesn't weigh anything. It's not adding a lot of weight. 
Now we go to body armor. I know that's what's on your mind. Do I integrate body armor or do I not? If you can take the weight, my answer is yes. <clears throat> Let's go to that cross draw. Obviously, there's no easy provision for front body armor because this is a vest. This is not a plate carrier. And I have reviewed this before and talked about it. What I would do, and there is a reason I reviewed this, guys, and it's from Botac Tactical. They had this really cool, low-profile ballistic plate carrier, and it is minimalist. Man, I hope they still have it. If so, I'll put a link below. If they don't, you are hosed. Because I, I tweeted it out around the Thanksgiving time frame, and I said, guys, buy this up. Right now, I have threat level 3A plates in it, but I could put this in it. Rifle plate, and this is a composite DP DKX plate reviewed years ago. Floats, this is lightweight, it is thick, it's a standalone, it doesn't need a backing plate on it, and this is threat level three. Awesome, and so I could integrate that into here and then put this on first, even over this jacket, and then I put my cross draw vest on. Now I'm armored up. This, as I have it configured now, is for pistol, which is uh, probably what you'll be confronted with, but who knows? Like I said, you could have a very super prepared and motivated group of bad guys show up with AKs. In that case, you want to run this. Just accept the weight and bulk penalty for it. Getting back to those other rigs. This one right here has hard plates in it. The DKX threat level 3A hard plate in it. So it's only set up for uh, pistol protection. In other words, it would not protect you against rifle fire. I could very well put this in it, and I have a weight down there, three pounds, two ounces, which is extraordinarily lightweight for rifle protection, but bulky. Put those in there front and back. A lot of TMPers are not caught flat-footed with what's going on. A lot of TMPers, honestly, for a soldier boy call-out, are not caught flat-footed. They actually come out pretty prepared. When I first started the drill, Jardine and I, we were seeing a lot of ridiculous stuff. We saw guys without ARs, we saw uh, no zero on their gun, uh, bad choice ammunition, sling problems, optics problems, and then as the years progressed, I was doing Soldier Boy, which I would expect people get their shit together, sorry, their crap together, and they start learning from the videos, and they go, oh, I learned from that guy's mistake, I'm not doing it, and then they show up, and they're good, and several guys have shown up with body armor, some are rocking DKX, or a composite plate that's lightweight. I probably would not recommend you guys running a heavy ceramic plate. Those are just too darn heavy, uh, unless you're in a static defensive location. And talk to, again, military guys who've humped that around, and you'll see why. But I've talked about it at length before. So this has those DKX plates in it, the rifle plates. So this sapper vest set up, again, that's a Glock 17, always an awesome, smart choice, or a 19 for that matter. Lots of great go-to-war pistols reviewed in TMP. Go look at my playlist on the A channel. So this is set up for rifle right here. So the answer is yes. Take armor if SAWC permits it. Will it save your life? There's no guarantee. You may take a round outside of it, but it's something. And without medical care or with very little medical care, you want to do everything possible not to get holes in you as you defend your family, your friends, your neighborhood, trying to reestablish rule of law if we go into that without rule of law situation. Fun video, fun video. How about slings? So we talked uh, in part one about weapon selection and it is widely variable. I'm sure you guys are making smart choices. I don't really have uh, too much in this video to say about slings because generally a simple sling is all you need. Getting back to my mini rant, Years ago, like 10 years ago in TMP, guys said, you need to review this sling. And I had insider information even back then. And I knew that that sling, I won't mention names, was basically way overpriced, that there were guys making a lot of money off of it. Uh, there were tactical type people promoting the slings. And I just thought it was so much horse shit. And I knew from a fact by running it myself that a simple sling like this, this is just a tag sling right here. It's nothing special, but it's lightweight. And it's simple. Remember that KISS principle and it works. Here's one from Botac Tactical. We've used this forever in the, in the project. Simple, lightweight. This is actually too long, so I would cut it down. So this is a two-point sling. 
it attaches as you would expect a sling to attach. It's quick adjust. It holds its adjustment. Comes in various colors. It's like 15 bucks. I knew for a fact those worked because I'd used them. The only reason I don't model slings too much in TMP anymore in the drills are because it's just too much in logistics. Uh, transferring the slings is just too much. And so it's, I just had to pare down the work. But when you go on a patrol, as a, you know, a neighborhood patrol officer will call them, you need to sling up. Here's one from TAG again. I got this at some trade show and it's fantastic. It's padded, lightweight. And I'll repeat that. You want a lightweight sling. Another thing I hated about these supposed awesome Gucci tactical slings. I'd lift it up and it's like eight ounces. And they're like, this thing is awesome. I was like, no, it isn't. I'd be at the trade show and he's like, man, you need to promote this. I was like, I ain't promoting that. He wanted me to promote it because it puts money in his pocket. So I was like, nah, I'll give you a link to some Botox slings or something below. Just use those. Attach them. Don't worry too much about slings. Remember, look at what our grandfathers used in World War II, what they used in Korea War. Did they, were they sitting around the campfire in the Korean War going, man, this sling sucks. What I really need is this. It had like leather slings with brass fittings on them. It worked. You know, as long as you keep your gun with you. Ideally, you do practice with that sling with your LBE system of choice. You make, and I've said this before, make sure you... Uh, get rid of all those interferences because you can't have a sling interfering with that horizontal, horizontally mounted pistol. You want to get rid of all of that. Okay, and you want to work your system. And by the way, you don't have to go out and run a gun to do that. You can do that at the house. You can suit up, walk around, put your sling on. Where's your pistol? Where's your ammo at? Do you have comms? What interferences do you have? How do you minimize them? Is there stuff rattling? Do I have to tape it down, Velcro it down, pre-flight your shit? There you go. So that, there's a little bit on slings. I could talk more, but I ain't going to. This video is going to go long enough. Okay, getting back to questions of TMP. And now we're going to get into nitty-gritty mission support gear. Guys will say, comms, 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 comms. You got to review comms. You got to review radios. Here's the deal, dudes. If you're in no kidding without rule of law, and I'm going to step away from SB for a minute. Let's assume the worst. And the worst is you don't have electricity to recharge your batteries. Any communication system worth its weight needs what? Wattage. And that means it's probably going to use a rechargeable battery because that's how it's going to get that wattage. <laughs> like how I said that, wattage. Um, it's true though, and I'm going to show you some of my systems. Yes, I do have comms, but I do so with the understanding that I need to recharge the batteries. They are short term only. Uh, I bought many years ago this system right here. I have several of these. These are Motorola XTNs, and it is the KU2100. So nice radio, UHF, I believe. And then on the back, I do put tape of when I charged it, and I say charge every three months. So with all the hell going down right now, I just recharge them because it trickled, you know, discharges. And there you go. I can use AA batteries in this, but again, do you have enough stored up? They take a lot. I think it's four a piece in this and they have a cartridge you put in. These are good radios and they're actually dual purpose. I didn't just buy them for without rule of law. We actually set up ranges uh, like our long range stuff, 400 yards beyond. I actually use these. So they're really good radios. I like them. They weren't that expensive in the day. I bought them from Botac for like 160 a piece. They're long gone. Don't even look for them. They're long gone. Here's another radio that I use. Uh, this one's awesome and it's in a really cool holder. This was made by some company, I forget. But anyways, this is a radio holder. So this is some of the stuff that maybe I would attach to my LBE in a certain location to minimize inf interference to talk to my team members. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying, hey, you don't need comms. What I'm saying is that they take a lot of battery and understand they're high maintenance. And a lot of guys do not consider that. And all they consider is the video game they see. And they see everybody head set it up and Navy SEALs run around. And I want to be like that. Comms are advantageous to coordinate with your team members of what's going on. Cell towers are probably down and non-functional. You get it. I can't even tell you what this is right here. It's an ICOM. It is fantastic. It has a lot of range. It comes with two different antennas on it. It has a rechargeable battery, battery pack. I bought it with a friend. We went in a group buy. Um, it is a little bit complex and non-intuitive to use. However, it does have transmit range and it is commercial grade, this thing right here. 
it's awesome so i have clips with it i have accessories i have external antennas and i got them for a really good price when i bought them in the day uh, there you go there you go i'm just throwing that out and this one's probably long gone and that's the thing about radios is that i could review a model and then two years later it's nowhere to be found and that, that's what happens so anyways that's it uh, frs radios i uh, haven't had great luck with them they could work in short ranges and frs family radio service what I have found about them, and I have owned a lot over the years, both Cobra and Motorola, is their batteries die, and they just quit working. They're not super high quality. I would probably go for commercial grade unless you want to keep rebuying them. But for short term, like what's going on now, if you want to have a comm capability, go buy a four pack of like Cobra FRS radios. They could work, and uh, and they have improved over the years. But you want to look at transmit power. Transmit power is distance. So. I forget exactly what wattage they have now, but two watts comes to mind. You want something that can transmit with a lot of oomph because that goes through obstacles. Now, I will show you something relatively Gucci. <clears throat> These are multi-purpose in TMP. These are actually uh, called Peltor Lightcom Pro 3s. These are freaking sick. So this is hearing protection integrated with a UHF radio headset, and it can... Uh, a, go to your Bluetooth device like a phone and it can talk to a bunch of headsets. It's actually meant, meant for a commercial work site like an oil rig. So you get hearing protection and you get a built-in uh, radio to talk to your people with. This is a sick system. Not a military system and those are awesome but guess what? We're not talking military stuff right now. We're talking Celine Sheepdog stuff that would work. Uh, also, it has an FM radio. The stations won't be working, of course. It's waterproof. And like I said, it runs off a rechargeable battery pack. There it is right there. So you want to have more than one battery pack and, and a way to recharge it. And it will run down, uh, I don't know, after a day of use. A lot of use, I have found. These aren't cheap, though. These are expensive. You know, but usually the really good kit is. Uh, would I run these during a patrol? If I had a need to, and that's another thing about comms that I want you guys to consider. If you have a radio on you, you need to ask yourself, who am I talking to and why? Do they know how to run a radio? Is it advantageous for them to be on the other end? If you do have a protocol that you've set up in your MC to run radios, how to respond, you have a certain vocabulary, you've gone over, hey, this means I need help, we're in this quadrant, in this sector, I say absolutely do it. But if you're going out and run radios and the person on the other end doesn't know what the heck you're saying, you know, why are you running your radio? Probably leave it. You know, it's just more complexity. I would run a radio with a team member I trusted, uh, that he knows his kit, he knows his weapons, and we have a common understanding, and I know that guy is reliable. I'd run a radio with that guy. Moving on. Here comes some more errata. And again, this is kind of going back to what guys have asked me, what to integrate into your, uh, well, Soldier Boy, I have seen guys come out with this. <laughs> and it's my fault too. Where did it go? Here we go. Do I run a knife on my LBE? Here's one. I mean, what is that? Uh, that is a SOG, not Northwest Ranger, but oh yeah, SOG Field Pup in black. Discontinued. Uh, I do like having a knife on my LBE for utility purposes, for self-defense purposes, but I really like a lightweight, as I've always called it, soldier blade. So a soldier blade is super lightweight, doesn't add any bulk to your loadout. When I see a guy running a really heavy survival knife on his LBE, I go, that guy doesn't know what the hell he's doing. I'm sorry, he doesn't. Anything over, for instance, eight ounces, it's, it's a fail for me. I was like, forget it, I ain't doing that. Well, like a big old survival knife. Uh, I, I, I knew guys, um, in the military that would rock that stuff on patrols and sooner or later generally sooner they just leave it they go yeah it's not worth it uh, i do like having a knife maybe something super inexpensive and really uh, affordable like the lightning i love these lightnings it's not a strong fixed blade but it's quick easy if you lose it you won't care you put this in uh, heck a nine millimeter ammo pocket the orange color would be easy to find and it also has another advantage and let me just slip it into this <clears throat> this pocket here to illustrate the point. So here it is in the LBE. The other advantage to having a folding knife or an auto knife like this, like an OTF, is that it doesn't really stick out. So if you get into a rough and tumble situation, which you just might, 
and a physical confrontation and he sees that fixed blade knife sitting on your LBE, guess who it can be used against? You. Have you ever thought of that? So think it through if you're going to put uh, an edged weapon easily accessible on your kit, whether on your belt, because if you get taken down and you could be, guy goes, oh, there's a knife right there and you're going to get have it come right in your face. And if you have a, an OTF knife, not so much. And if you put that in tan color, he won't even see it. Just a, just a thought. How about multi-tools? Um, yes. I, I'm a big advocate of multi-tools. You can go with something small and lightweight, integrate that. I would not go with an MDMT. I would go with an LDMT like I've ranted about forever. Water. Uh, yes. Be realistic, though. If you're going on a neighborhood patrol for eight hours, <coughs> not COVID, I promise. And you know you have resupply, don't carry like a gallon of water with you unless you have a propensity not to have resupply. Follow? So we're always going back to mission. What's our mission? What's a realistic uh, loadout for me? Please do that. But I would have water on me. I don't like camelbacks so much because they taste funky. I've never gotten past that. Uh, they're weird to drink out of. Every time I drink out of the tube, the water's like 100 degrees in the summertime. I hate them. I'll just take a bottle with me somewhere. Okay? I don't absolutely need to drink out of a tube. I got time to pull out a bottle. I've been doing it hiking. I've been doing it in the desert for well over a decade. It don't matter. No problem. Yes, do have water. Gloves, absolutely. Your hands are going to get shredded. I've ranted forever about gloves. You should have lightweight tactical gloves. These are some old school mechanics, coyote gloves, the originals in coyote. Fantastic. Uh, the pig gloves, I pretty much quit using because they just shred up so much. They're not very well made. Uh, I shouldn't say they're not well made. They're just not durable. Hearing protection. <clears throat> I did show you this, uh, granted, Gucci device right here. It is cool. The disadvantage is it's very bulky to shoot on your gun. So maybe better would be some low profile shotgun muffs. And would I wear those on a patrol? Yeah. Uh, how about soldier boy call out? Absolutely. You need hearing protection. I would not just run foam. I have custom made inserts. You've seen them before. Then I wear hear, uh, hearing pro over that. But I have found even without electronic hearing muffs, I can uh, communicate with them. I can hear no problem. You can do that on patrol. You don't want to blow your eardrums out guys. Talk to guys who have been in firefight, firefights, police officers, especially in, inside. It is a lot. You'll have permanent ringing. It ain't worth it. Lighting. Oops, mic came off. On we go. But I'm not really representing the weapon mounted light here in the bunker just because it was too much to prep. But you've seen it before. You know what it is. I do recommend running one on your gun. Which one? Take your pick. The O lights are fantastic. I love them. Uh, there's some good surefires out there for sure. Uh, there's so many good brands. Uh, I'll put some links below of some of my faves if you need a weapon light but do have one. And they are light enough now where they're not going to really weigh your weapon down. That's really important because, again, the KISS principle is this. Don't put extra crap on your guns that you don't need. Oh, and by the way, you are looking at one of my primary, without rule of law, choices for AR-15s right here ladies and gentlemen of TMP. Also for Soldier Boy, this could handle the job quite well. Super lightweight, it's my own build. And what do you know, there's that power range, one to six. Not ideal for Soldier Boy, but it could work. Pretty much ideal for without rule of law. Again, there are some variances in my way of shooting. That's all I'm saying. So for me, shooting out to 400 yards, I want more than six power. That's all I'm saying. It's probably because I suck. Granted, I suck. I need more magnification. For really good shooters, they're like, yeah, six power is fine. And they do. They connect at 400 yards all day long with that. I do have a couple, you know, high speed things on there, like a mad lever, good trigger, BCM components, MFT stock, stuff I've talked about. Yeah, but weapon light, absolutely. Uh, would I double up and put another light on my person or on my LBE? Uh, I would say probably, but it depends. It depends. Uh, are you doing a night patrol? Uh, if it's just a daytime patrol, maybe it's not worth the wait. Uh, how long you you walking for? Depends. For Soldier Boy, I would say yes, because you're going to need the light out there. Uh, 
we almost always shoot at night and I, again I love the O lights with their reverse clips because I have an instant you know this is coming right headlamp like this I mean this is how I operate out in the desert all the time sorting gear and soldier boy doing that and guess what in and without rule of law you're going to be doing that all the time as well so you don't just want a weapon light two is one one is none you want a pocket light too this is a s20 i believe and the s2r is just the same thing a little bit bigger fantastic lights do have lights i could say a lot more but we got to press on how about uh, first aid kits absolutely again just like the comms you got to make sure the people know how to use it Okay, so if you have first aid kits on your person, everybody should be instructed on how to use it, how to stop bleeding, how to stop trauma, how to treat shock, all that stuff. I will integrate a first aid kit on my LBE. Um, how about tourniquets? Four of them I hear you should carry. Uh, have a tourniquet for sure, but again, who's using that tourniquet? Do they have training? And the really good tourniquets that everyone seems to recommend weigh a lot. They're like four ounces a piece. So to have four, you're looking at a pound of weight for for four tourniquets. Uh, again, it makes me question if those guys are getting handoffs on the side. Hey, buy this brand of tourniquet. He gets a, a case of them for free. Probably uh, armor I've talked about for sure. Have uh, wipes with you, antibacterial wipes if you can. Something you can't get right now with COVID have those integrated probably in your accessory pouch and I did show you my accessory pouch right here so you can put your antibacterial wipes here chapstick maybe some treats there uh, stuff you'd uh, access on your LBE sunscreen for sure any personal items during the patrol uh, bug juice if you need it if you're in an area that has mosquitoes and stuff absolutely uh, how about flexicuffs handcuffs if you know how to use them, if you know how to get the dude down on the ground and bind them up, I would say absolutely use them. If you don't, research it, integrate flexicuffs. It's a great way to restrain someone uh, for maybe the authorities that are operating in your area. Again, we're not trying to be the law. It's just that, uh, and again, I'm talking about without rule of law, not SB, we don't have an option. And so, to constrain someone and preserve his life i say absolutely i'm all for that again we're always treating it down here we never want to go to a higher force level than we have to we always we're staying down here negotiation is the basis for everything and then we ramp it up there maybe with some less than lethal options and then if we have to rpg <laughs> if we have to uh now as we talk about stuff to integrate uh, in your LB again don't put stuff in there that's ridiculous so do you need a hundred foot of cordage mm, probably not that's more survival kit stuff you could put it in your pack it doesn't weigh a lot but I don't know if you're going to use it that much uh, you could and if you have it keep it but fishing kits like I mentioned no uh, do you need a fire kit in your LBE that's more survival kit. I mean, if that's the case, and throw on your survival kit and a lightweight backpack, and that should all be put together. Uh, stoves, no. Just stuff that's survivally, that's not what this is about. It's a temporary eight hour shift on a neighborhood patrol or soldier boy. Don't carry a bunch of camping gear with you. You're getting confused in your philosophies of use, and I have spent some time with that. Uh, extra socks and gloves. Depends on your resupply. You could put that in. That seems to me more like long range patrol stuff. And that would be more like Red Sky stuff where we were living out our, our packs and we had a full tactical loadout with sappers, mind you. This style again, we were actually, I was using a M1A at the time. That's a lot of weight, by the way. So you're carrying a full complement of camping gear plus tactical gear and a pistol, Glock mag, sapper mags. My pack, my whole loadout was like 80 pounds. And that was like making some hard decisions of leaving stuff back with no comms. I didn't have this. Choose your gear wisely. Uh, ground cloth, maybe that's more camping stuff. Optics. Optics are actually a probably a good thing to integrate uh, if you're talking about, uh, we're going to step away from Soldier Boy and go to Without Roll of Law. Why is that? Because you want to know what the hell is going on. Okay, intelligence, uh, as far as knowing what's going on around you is important. So being able to see people at distance, identify who it is, what are they doing, have a really good pair of binoculars. These are some of my Leicas. I absolutely love them. I think I have reviewed them. Did it in the Zodiac years ago. 
uh, yeah, it'd be great to have. And notice they're small, they're lightweight, they're compact, they fold up, they can integrate into just, heck, where's that cross drive vest? Can integrate in this pocket. I love this pocket on a cross drive vest, by the way. I use it to hold a phone, batteries, ammunition, and now a pair of binoculars. Optics, you bet. Now you may think, well, I've got an optic on my rifle. What's wrong with me just using that? Honestly, without rule of law, you probably could, but it's not super convenient. You have to hold, hold it up forever. Is it the best option? I don't know. Zip ties, different than flexicuffs. I say integrate them. They're super lightweight to carry. They handle a lot of different situations. They're problem solvers, have different sizes that you think you would need. Knee pads. I don't know if I brought some in the bunker, but uh, I would say yes. Not necessary, but it'd be nice to have. Uh, depends, again, if you anticipate kneeling a lot. If you're not kneeling, you might want to just dispense with the knee pads. Now, in Soldier Boy, going back to SB, I would say an absolute yes, because you will be knee kneeling a lot. You will be on the ground. It's almost guaranteed. You will be picking up your brass after you're done, and knee pads are very convenient for that, and they do protect your knee knees. Along with that, how about um, a drop pouch? Or as I've always called it, a douche pouch. Uh, yes, uh, do integrate that because last time I checked, you don't have a Chinook helicopter coming in and dropping you in more magazines. You probably want to preserve the ones you have and throw them into your douche pouch. Uh, again, that's going back to old school TMP. We used to rant about that all, all the time, and it's absolutely true. Sleeping material, space blanket, space bag. Do I put that in my LBE? maybe a space blanket for treating shock, but I wouldn't say, hey, again, turn it into a camping system. That's not what your LBE system is about. It's about defensive uh, martial weapon system. That's, that's what it's about. So uh, probably not. I, I'm not going to put one in mine. Again, that's, that's going to be in a different system altogether. Extra batteries. Well, if you have a battery-powered optic of any type, that's the one thing I will store in my pistol grips right here. So this is battery powered. I store an extra one in my pistol grip. If if I have like an 18650 flashlight like this one, yes, I'll have another battery on me because you know Murphy's Law. If it can fail, it will fail at the least opportune moment. Uh, and I do like the 18650. I know it's a rechargeable power cell. You can use two CR123 primaries to replace it in a sleeve. But if you can recharge it, the 18650 is absolutely amazing. Uh, and then I'm going to pretty much wrap it up. <laughs> There's some other stuff that I have here. Uh, I know you guys are going to love this video. I just know it uh, because I've answered a lot of questions that have been out there for a very long time. Um, but remember who this video is meant for and what it's intended to do. It's intended for you to be ready for that knock at the door. Maybe not at 8.45 p.m. That's the old way we used to do it. Now we call you the night before because it's just better that way. That way we don't waste a lot of time. And then you show up, actually not the night before, you get called the same day and you, you show up within a couple hours for a soldier boy call out. And remember the soldier boy call out is 25 yards to 400 yards, adverse conditions at night, which means you probably need an illuminated optic. I forgot to mention that. And a fair amount of running, you need to know kind of how your gun works. You need to have it zeroed. That's job one. And in the early years, they weren't zeroed. Guys meant to zero it and the, they start shooting. They're not hitting nothing. It's like, is your gun zero? They're like, mm, well, it was for steel. Uh, talking like steel rounds like wolf. And I was like, well, dude, you're shooting brass now. It's a totally different zero. You need, uh, we're going to assume you're competent on a basic level. Now, I do at, uh, advocate you guys practicing as much as you can. Practice with your guns of choice, whatever it is. Practice with your pistol. Practice reloading and just getting that muscle memory down. You don't necessarily have to go to a range to do that. You can do it safely in your basement, at your house. Again, always pointing in a safe direction and being sure of your backdrop. But you can practice reloading and all the mechanics of shooting. And I can really tell, by the way, when we have a soldier boy call out, when we have a TMP or who has done just that. It's really hard. Never mind what's going on now, the end of the world. But before, when things are normal, it's really hard to find time to do that. If you're working, you have a family, to go out and, and practice and train to that level all the time. Trust me, I totally get it. 
but you can do it at the house. And I can tell, we can tell like Jardine and I, the guy comes out and like, okay, he's practiced. And we've talked to you guys like, Hey, you're really good with your reloads. You seem comfortable. He's like, yeah, I practice at the home. And I was like, okay, there you go. So practice, get that physical fitness to a level that is acceptable. I'm not act, asking you to be a marathoner like a campfire talk. <laughs> no, that guy is shredded, man. I mean, he can run like 25 miles and I've even breaking a sweat. No, I, I just want you to be able to walk 10 miles. If you can't do that, walk five miles. Because if without real walk kicks off and I become uh, the leader of my micro community, I'm gonna look to people who are physically fit. I was like, can, well, can you do a patrol? I mean, here's your loadout. Maybe I give them a bolt action loadout because they don't have anything. Uh, you know, Savage Axis, 308, stuff I talked about in part one. Are you guys capable? Can you do it? And if they're not, guess what? They're not useful to the community. I ranted about that a lot. Uh, you don't have to be an operator. Okay, you don't, you don't have to act like an operator, dress like an operator, but you do have to have a certain level of competence to be useful okay, to yourself, to your family, to your friends, and to your community. Soldier Boy tests that. That's what this series of videos is really about. By association, especially with what's going on, guys are going to be looking at the rule without rule of law component to that. And I totally get it. Uh, I'm on board with that too. If you're prepared for that, uh, then you're prepared to do what we're trying to do in these situations. Moving away from SB, but we're trying to bring back rule of law. We're trying to get our larger communities, our cities, our towns operating again, getting their police forces up and operating again so we can go back into our homes and get on with our freaking lives. We can go back to our jobs. And we don't have to spend every waking moment defending ourselves against evil. It's not fun. It's horrible. It's energy draining. And I hope we never have to do it. But if we have to do it, you have a choice. Are you going to let evil win and just come in and roll in your neighborhood and steal things and hurt people, maybe kill people, set things on fire? Or are you going to stand up and be a man and take care of business and tell bad guys around your area, this is not a place you want to come. This is not a place because we have people ready to answer you that are prepared and we will not put up with your crap. Okay, we are God-fearing Americans. And we believe in the Constitution. The whole Constitution was arranged for this very element we're talking about. Everyone talks about target shooting, hunting, sport shooting. No, it's defending against tyranny. And then, of course, defending against the opportunistic wolves of society, which will come out of the shadows and without rule of law. Mark my words. You will see it. And it will not be good. But you will survive. You will make it rule of law will emerge again have faith have hope you have prepared congratulations now before i wrap it up tactically squared away part two couple things i forgot i'm glad i remembered them i have had questions uh specific gear items guys ask should i integrate a bipod to my gun of choice and this is just a an inexpensive utg bipod that by the way works just fine it's not Gucci. The tactical elitists would hate it. But guess what? I've shot off these for like 10 years and they've never failed. They work. But my answer is it depends. Uh, is it worth the weight? Most of them are going to be about 12 to 16 ounces. You need to ask, uh, is that a good weight? And it's going to go up where uh, it's really critical towards the front of the gun up here. So your swing is slowed down. Uh, earlier in TMP, I ran bipods all the time, like a uh, uh, Serenity, I, I ran a bipod there. Arm Serenity, I'm talking about. Mm, I don't anymore because it's, it's violating the KISS principle. I would probably say no, except for your support shooter who is providing cover with a sapper. Definitely have a bipod for him or her. Uh, and then guys will ask, how about a suppressor, a can? I would say absolutely. Absolutely. Especially if you choose to run a short barreled rifle, like a short AK. Uh, maybe uh, an AR-15 pistol. TD and I have talked about that. Uh, it's almost mandatory with an AR-15 pistol. You're going to blow your drums out without it. But it also gives you a slight element of surprise, uh, a little more clandestine because you don't know where the shots are coming from. Uh, it does add weight. It adds length to the gun. 
it is more complexity, but I am a big advocate of uh, a suppressor on the gun. I'm not really modeling it in the bunker here because there were just too many logistics to prep for, but I'm probably showing you some footage of me shooting a can. I love them, and the answer is yes. If you have one, it is lightweight, uh, run a can. I think it would do well. The only caveat I would say is if you anticipate doing mag dump after mag dump, a can probably isn't a good idea that can actually uh, start to smoke and do bad things and they will burn flesh when they're that hot. Uh, just a couple things. I've got to wrap it up. This is the end. Tactically Squared Away two-part series. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for being a donor. The link is below. Please support me. It's so much work. It's a lot of cost. Uh, I'm fully independent. Uh, again, I'm not a sellout, never have been. Uh, and the upside is you just get a really, really honest, sometimes brutally honest take on all this stuff like you've seen in this video. Uh, but I think that's what will stand the test of time. Truth stands the test of time. Um, will you ever get a soldier boy call out? <laughs> we, we don't do that many because it's not devoured content in TMP and never has been. If it was, I've talked about it, we'd do a lot more. Who knows, maybe. But I guess the big benefit of this is we have talked about some pretty serious issues about the good people of the United States of America uh, and all over the world who wish to preserve life, that wish to defend themselves, their family, their friends, their neighbors against, again, these wolves that will come out of the shadows. I, I think it's going to happen, uh, but be prepared. You can handle it, like I said. There we go. Thanks so much, Lieutenant Colonel Nutton Fancy, signing off. More videos to come. You'll see them break first. They're at the uh, Patreon channel. Over now.